Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience there uh, while we're getting situated. I'm Paul at the library, and I'm here with uh, Hot Springs National Park Ranger, Tyler Young, who's gonna give you a virtual tour of baseball's golden years here in Hot Springs. And uh, where are they now? Look at some of baseball's notables throughout history. So welcome, Ranger Young. Thank you for joining us, and uh, I'll let you take yeah. over. All right, well, glad to be here. And, uh, you know, baseball is a very superstitious sport. So uh, perhaps I did something to, to bring a curse on our internet here, but looks like we're all up and uh, running. So we'll just go with it. I uh, hope everyone's doing good uh, and, in, and has uh, a stable internet connection on their end. So anyway, yeah, like I said, um, or like Paul said, we'll be looking at um, sort of the golden years of baseball here in Hot Springs. So really uh, professional baseball um, and how it, how it uh, took root here. So uh, I'll just go ahead and dive right into it and, and, and waste no more time. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, first I just want to uh, cite my sources for this talk. Um, can everyone see that slide there? Uh, no, sir. You'll need to share it again. Oh, okay. I think we had lost uh, it earlier when I, we had the start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Here we go. Excellent. So. Um, there, the good news is here, um, you know, if, if I'm going to be given a broad overview tonight of, of the history of baseball here, so there's not a whole lot of time to delve into any one story, but the good news is that um, if anything piques your interest, um, there's a lot of public information out there uh, about this. So uh, there's some print sources here. Uh, this is Boiling Out at the Springs uh, by Don Duran. Um, this will this will be your major source. It will cover the entire history of uh, professional spring training here in Hot Springs. Uh, we also have a great uh, image book here, uh, Baseball in Hot Springs by Mark Blower. Um, great, uh, great, uh, concise sort of uh, version of what we're going to talk about. Um, there's also uh, a book specifically on the uh, Hot Springs Bathers, who were a um, minor league team here from 1938 to uh, 1955. Uh, then, of course, uh, recently there was a uh, film called The First Boys of Spring um, that, of course, covers the spring training tradition here. And uh, the great news about all of those that I just mentioned, by the way, is they are available at your public library uh, to check out. Uh, there's some web uh, resources as well. The Arkansas Baseball Encyclopedia is an excellent searchable archive. Um, and then, of course, um, the Garland County Historical Society. A lot of the photographs that we're going to look at tonight come from their collection, uh, as well as some newspaper clippings. Uh, so uh, they are a great resource on all things Hot Springs and Garland County. Uh, when I went there, they, I got a piece of cake. I wouldn't count on that. Uh, actually <laughs> when you were go there, but that was a nice treat, friendly people. Um, so yeah, we'll dive right in. So if you're watching this, um, I'm guessing that you've got an interest in history or baseball or probably both. Uh, I certainly fall into the latter category. And the great thing about being a fan of history or in baseball is you can actually have your own personal history with baseball to draw from. Um, and as a fan of history in general, that is normally not the case. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, I really like studying the ancient world, right? But I have no idea how it would have felt to, for instance, stand in line with the Macedonian hoplites, right? And face down war elephants with Alexander in India. Nor can any modern historian, you know, no matter how good a writer they are, tell me how that would have looked at. So you know, we've got this artist rendition here from the 17th century that is absolutely not what it would have looked at, but, you know, who am I to say? However, you know, I do have some idea of what it took for Willie Mays to make that famous over-the-shoulder basket catch in 1954, 
against my beloved Cleveland team. Um, you know, and that's not because I was ever that great of a player, but I, I did play the sport and I also watched it either on TV or in person. And so, you know, I have a little understanding of what it might take to actually make that amazing catch. Uh, and I'm guessing that for some of you following along, you have a lifelong interest in the sport that was sparked at an early age, either by watching baseball or by playing it. Uh, you might say that you grew up with the sport, right? So for me, I, I did grow up with baseball. Uh, it, if it wasn't my first sport, that was actually soccer, uh, then it was one of the first. Uh, and it was, it was a family activity. My dad coached uh, my team when I got older. I played on the varsity squad. Uh, my mom assures me that these two pictures are indeed the same kid. Those are both me somehow. Um, some of my warmest memories from that time come from a Sunday afternoon ballpark, uh, goofing around with friends or, you know, going actually and watching a game in Cleveland. Um, and I always collected those little ice cream uh, plastic helmets, you know, they were sold in. So, you know, th this is a personal history that I can draw on. So, you know, let me ask you this, you know, if, if you played baseball as a kid or watched it or went to games, do you still play it, right? Think about that, reflect on it. Um, because for me, as much as I love the sport of baseball, the answer is no. And when I think about that, it, it, it troubles me a little bit, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you, we do as a kid that, that you don't do as an adult. Um, but it just brings up this question, right? If you grew up with baseball, is moving on from it a necessary part of that process somehow? In other words, you grow up and out of things. So not to say that you cut baseball completely out of your life, um, but you just change the nature of your relationship to it. So, you know, most of us are not going to devote as much time to it, you know, unless you're a professional. Um, but for me, baseball does pop back into my life each spring. And uh, at the start of each season, I, I want to follow my Cleveland team. Um, but I have to admit, I, I really couldn't tell you the name of anyone on their roster right now. In fact, I, I probably know more uh, hot spring baseball names now than I do Cleveland baseball names. So, but you know, the mark of those years remain, uh, obviously, um, because when I found out that hot springs had such uh, a unique role in the formative years of baseball, I wanted to do a program on it. And, and maybe that's my way of of keeping that spark alive. And, and maybe that's why you're here too, right? To, to keep that element of your childhood, that lost piece somehow alive. So, you know, in some way, I think the story of baseball in Hot Springs is essentially a story about growing up. So, you know, if you, if you give me a little creative license here, I, I, I think this is a story of two American icons, right? Baseball, uh, hot Springs, America's national pastime and the American spa, uh, growing up together, carving out a place for themselves in the national consciousness, right? Deals with all those issues of growing up, figuring things out, awkwardness, forming relationships, relationships ending, the aftermath, it's all very juicy stuff. And it kind of breaks down into a rough beat uh, as I have here. So if you look at the first half of the 19th century, right, that's the adolescent years of both. So both are getting a feel for how the world works, laying foundations for future exploration with baseball, trying out rules, which ones work, which ones don't. In Hot Springs, this is the era you have the first bathhouses built, which are very rudimentary structures. In the second half of the 19th century, it's kind of more uh, awkward teenage years, a rapid growth. You're really moving now, um, but you also have these, these vicious struggles for survival, right? Popularity contests is what, is what I'm talking about, essentially. So baseball, you've got these national associations vying for supremacy, uh, laying the foundation for the first professional leagues. And Hot Springs, you've got this clash with the uh, when the federal government finally arrives and sees that a city has grown up in the, in the reservation and we have to figure out 
how to divide up and uh, the land and, and, and live uh, within each, or beside each other. Um, and then as we move into the 20th century and entering a, a, a more stable period of adulthood, this is really the prime, right? You're in full control of your future. So baseball is, is front page news throughout this era. Uh, the legends that we talk about today in large part are from uh, this time period. And with hot springs, of course, uh, we have our peak bathing years in this time frame. And then, of course, the second half of the uh, 20th century, maybe um, a midlife crisis. You know, uh, baseball uh, has new sports competing with it, modern era scandals, uh, hot springs. We have the decline of the bathing industry and the need to, to reinvent oneself. So, again, if you create that little or if you if you give me that little creative license there, keep that framework in mind. It's going to help guide us through this, this exploration. Um, so let's look at it. Let's look at the birth of baseball and hot springs side by side, right? Um, so, of course, you've got the legend uh, Abner Doubleday, right? That's – we're just going to throw that out. Um, that's not really um, where baseball originated. And, of course, with hot springs – it originated as Hot Springs Reservation in 1832. Um, and with baseball, of course, like I said, the origins go back a lot further than, than, um, than the 1830s, right, to ancient ball and stick games. Uh, in fact, there are multiple English games that were brought to America by the colonists, uh, paddle ball, trap ball, rounders. If you look in the literature, you find a lot of these strange sounding names. And, You'll even start to see in the 18th and 19th century references to, to, to baseball. And even if you look at uh, Valley Forge, right, in the American Revolution, uh, we find evidence that they might have played a game similar to baseball, which, which puts the sport fittingly uh, at the very center of our nation's creation story. And likewise, you know, if we look back at Hot Springs, it's, it's birth as a resort town can be very confusing. So if you look at, you know, this entire area, along the entire Mississippi River Basin, it, it fell under the jurisdiction of the United States in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, but it, it's a little more complicated than that, right? Because the U.S. legal system that hereafter was imposed upon this territory recognizes land claims of, of American Indian tribes. And so in the Arkansas Territory, the U.S. government would have to deal mainly with three tribes, right? the Quapaw, Caddo, and, and Osage. And so in 1818, there was a treaty negotiated with the Quapaw to, to formally cede lands to the U.S. that included the site of the hot springs. Um, so at this point, the slate is clean for the United States to claim in 1832 uh, the hot springs of Arkansas. Now, if we look back at baseball, as we're entering in the middle part of the 19th century, um, it's an awkward, strange-looking game to the modern viewer. Um, so, you know, by the 1840s, right, we can see certain aspects of the modern era. You've got the bases, um, but you still see... Uh, strange elements, right? So you've got a square, not really a diamond there. The striker or batter is standing in between a, a fourth and a first base. Um, there are also rules like uh, you could get a runner out by actually throwing and, and hitting that person with the ball, which I'm really glad didn't make it into the modern game. Um, and so there were different rule sets sort of vying for modern adoption and eventually one that sort of tilted this field at an angle, lengthened the bases to 90 feet um, and, and made runners stay on defined bay pass. Uh, that is the one that came to be. So that is really when we start to get the foundation in the 1840s um, with the New York Knickerbocker Club that, um, that set the modern standard uh, for the game. And so I think you know, when we settle on the actual shape of the field for baseball, uh, it's very distinctive, right? It's not a rectangle, it's a diamond. And this is really when uh, baseball sort of is able to stand on its own. Now, 
so we've got sort of the rule sets coming into being, but, but how about the teams, right? So this was an era before professional teams. And, and so it was, it was clubs really, uh, you know, not, they were gentlemen's clubs. So these were growing up in urban areas, um, you know, by 1861 and six Americans were living in a town or city. And so you had this demand for recreation, like, baseball. And so these organizations, they had memberships, right? Uh, not rosters. They had elected non-athletic positions like secretaries, what we might think of as front office jobs now in a professional club. And, and there are no set schedules. Um, so the secretaries of each club contacted each other to set up games. And so in 1858, we get something akin to a league with a National Association of Baseball Players. Uh, it's a very descriptive name. It's an association of the nation's 25 best clubs at the time. And it, it was actually player led. So these are still gentlemen's clubs, not teams with owners out to make a financial gain. Uh, although it was becoming obvious that the growing popularity of the sport uh, held the promise of commercializing it. And so among other innovations, like standardizing a nine in game, the association allowed clubs to start charging admission to games. Um, and one, one game between New York and Brooklyn uh, saw 1,500 people paying 50 cents a piece to watch. So that's $750, which is not a bad haul for back then. And so baseball's uh, growing appeal at this point made its ascension to the status of, of America's game pretty certain. But, of course, by 1860, uh, you have a presidential election that would threaten the undoing of the United States. And so we have this question, would, would um, the game survive? And likewise, you have a, a question of survival over in, in Hot Springs. It, it was left in a way without parental supervision. It was birthed into this world by Congress who sent no oversight uh, to manage it. Um, but that didn't stop people from coming here uh, and commercializing. Uh, building crude bathhouses, hotels to, to house newcomers. Uh, this was really the, the beginning of the American spa, or at least built it up. And, and the first bathhouse was built in 1830, uh, actually prior to the, the reservation. Um, and in the following years, we see an early version of, of Bathhouse Row growing up along Hot Springs Creek, which sort of became rife with sewage, uh, sort of like the, like the diaper of, of Hot Springs. Uh, but the place was starting, like baseball, to walk upright on its own. Um, so, of course, as we said, the election of 1860, it led very quickly to the start of the Civil War. Uh, this conflict, conflict had, had uh, really different effects on baseball in Hot Springs. So, for baseball, it was actually kind of a net positive. Uh, soldiers on both sides of the conflict uh, played it as a popular recreation sport in camps, uh, both, both in the field and in POW camps. And um, actually in Arkansas, there are several references from soldiers' journals to, to baseball or, or similar game at this time. And, um, you know, baseball probably reached entirely new populations during the war. Um, so I, I think it's safe to say that while the Civil War certainly disrupted play between baseball clubs. It, it really grew the sport itself. And the numbers, you know, bear that out. If we, if we look at the National Association again, after the war, it, it exploded to 300 clubs. Uh, the first recorded game of baseball in Arkansas uh, comes in 1867 in Little Rock between the Pulaski and Galaxy baseball clubs. Um, the Arkansas Gazette actually records the score of that game as 67 to 15. So it's pretty obvious that the rules were probably still a little bit different back then. Um, that would be, that would be a, an odd, odd outcome. <laughs> uh, for, you know, Hot Springs, the war had a decidedly destructive effect during the conflict. Um, so at its outset, first of all, most of the men in town left. It was drained of, of, of men, um, mostly to the Confederate Army. And, and skirmishes took place nearby, um, but by and large, it wasn't really the site of any large battles or really an important strategic location. 
apart from a you know the governor briefly fleeing here from Little Rock in 1862. But but supplies were mostly drained outward, not inward. The town itself ceased expanding. And what's worse, armed militias harboring either pro-Confederacy or pro-Union allegiances were operating around Hot Springs and, and actually burned a lot of structures. And I've got this photo from right after the war. If you look closely, you can see freestanding chimneys that, that were left over uh, from structures that had probably burned from these uh, militias. So, you know, though Hot Springs did suffer a lot during the war, um, the post-war surge in interest in, in coming to and recuperating here was would really prove to be a boon for the town. And it was the, the following half century that Hot Springs widely becomes known as a place of healing. Um, and that also happens to coincide with the first professional baseball players and teams coming here. Of course, you could probably guess in search of its, its physical benefits uh, to gain a competitive edge over their rivals. So if we look then at these post-war years, they're, they're pretty fun. They're pretty wild going back to our um, metaphor, right? These, these would be the teenage years. Um, and of course, in those years, you've got a lot of competition, right? Um, popularity contest. Baseball was winning uh, its own popularity contest and growing, as we said. This led to uh, increased opportunity for profit, um, which of course led to increased competition among the numerous clubs to take their share of that profit. And so Signing star players became necessary for survival, and the emerging class of these pros would soon supplant the amateur class at the top of the, the baseball world. Um, and of course, in an era before well-regulated well leagues, um, these dealings could be of questionable ethical content. The, the practice of signing players to contracts was largely done without publicity, um, behind closed doors. Uh, I'm showing here Cincinnati Red Stockings. They were the first openly all pro team, the one that said, hey, this is we're all professionals here. Um, they folded, I think, after a season. It wasn't yet uh, profitable to run a team like that. Now, if we look at Hot Springs, it was uh, struggling with some issues itself. Um, so just as baseball clubs, right, were, were scrambling to secure star talent for, for their teams, uh, bathhouse operators of 1870s hot springs were, were locked in competition to secure patrons. Uh, this gave rise to a practice referred to as, as drumming, where agents would refer newcomers to a particular bathhouse for a cut of the, the fee. Uh, these drummers could be physicians who would claim a uh, particular malady could best be cured by the waters at this bathhouse. Uh, the drumming evil, uh, as it was called, infected every aspect of a trip here, uh, from these house doctors to agents planted in hotels and, and even on the incoming trains, which this is a, a leaflet I'm showing here from a, a, a train. And they're all trying to steer you to a certain bathhouse. So it'd take a lot of years and, and stricter and stricter regulations to finally rid hot springs of this element, just like it would take many years to really codify what would become Major League Baseball. Uh, and that really started, uh, if we look back at baseball, uh, with the National League. So the Amateur National Association, don't confuse those two, uh, eventually disbanded in 1874. Um, there was a, a short-lived National Association of Professional Baseball Players, um, and among this league was the first professional team to play in Arkansas, and that happened in 1875 when they took on an amateur team in Little Rock. Um, now, the National League forms the following year in 1876, which is coincidentally the U.S. centennial. It's just baseball is so wrapped up in, in the mythos of this nation. <laughs> Um, and it was the owner of the Chicago White Stockings um, that was the principal driver of this event. And the White Stockings are National League club, um, so they're the precursor to today's Cubs, not the White Sox, which is an American League club. Um, so it was this team, the White Stockings from Chicago, that would bring professional baseball to Hot Springs 10 years later. Um, 
So again, the, the National League isn't the first professional baseball league, but it was the first profitable one. And that is really because it was run by club investors and not players. And so that's why it survived. And um, of course it survives, as we said, to this day, it, it forms one half of Major League Baseball, the other being the, the Younger American League, which was established in 1901. Uh, so prior to the American League and the, the agreement between them, um, the National League would fend off various, various other rival leagues. Now, if we turn our attention back to Hot Springs, uh, just as the National League was bringing stability and order to the professional game, uh, the U.S. government finally decided to establish a presence here. Uh, the first superintendent, uh, Benjamin Kelly, uh, arrived in 1877. Um, around that time, a land commission was set up to sort of to sort out um, what would remain uh, federal reservation land and what would become essentially private property. Um, and so, this is, of course, when you start to see the modern town of of Hot Springs and the modern Hot Springs Reservation sort of taking shape. Um, and so that, that land claim was settled eventually in 1880, and you get a greatly reduced reservation uh, shown in the hatch mark there. Um, but that forms the nucleus of the modern day Hot Springs National Park, which along with an addition in, in 1938, um, forms what mostly what we have today. And so by the 1880s, uh, we can say that both baseball and, and hot springs had, had gone through quite a bit of awkwardness and growing pains, uh, but had finally started to figure things out for themselves. Um, in fact, the period from like 1883 to 1891 was, was pretty much a golden age for professional baseball. Um, leading teams were raking in profits, um, but it was still a pretty wild ride um, before the sport would, would reach maturity. Uh, there's still some experimentation going on with the pitcher and batter setup. You're still going to see really skewed scores. Um, you'll see seasons where batting averages were skyrocketing over, you know, 400. And so, um, yeah, that, you know, you even got, uh, this is really funny. I didn't know this, uh, a precursor to the modern world series in this era, the um, national league and another league, the American association, which would end up folding, um, would have these uh, postseason championship uh, sort of series, but they could be anywhere from three to 15 games, and, and they sometimes even ended in a tie. So they really, it isn't like the modern World Series. Um, another important difference here is, of course, the, the lack of spring training. And so players were not yet expected to train in the offseason. Um, and it, often reported for duty the next season sluggish and, and out of shape. And so in a professional sport that was increasingly becoming a cutthroat business with profits tied to success on the field, you could see that this was becoming an unacceptable way of doing things. Uh, and so it was the Chicago White Stockings with its innovative owner, Al Spalding, um, who innovated again and brought baseball and hot springs together uh, in, in a relationship that would really uh, improve both of them, I think. So if we look at the 1885 season uh, for the Chicago White Stockings, it, it had its ups and downs. On the one hand, they won the American League pennant, or sorry, National League pennant, uh, but in that ensuing World's Championship Pseudo World Series thing uh, with the American Association's uh, St. Louis Browns, um, a team that a lot of people considered inferior, they actually couldn't really determine a clear winner. Um, depending on who you ask, the series either ended in a tie um, with a win attributed to Chicago after St. Louis actually walked off the field to protest a, a, a call, um, or, you know, it, it didn't win in a, in, or it didn't end up in a tie and, and um, rather St. Louis claimed victory. So it was kind of up in the air. And either way, Al Spalding was not happy with his team's performance. And he suspected critically some of his players' performance had been affected by their drinking habits. Um, in fact, he was of the mind that the entire National League should enforce abstinence from alcohol among their players during 
both the playing season and the off season in order to maintain physical fitness. And for Spalding particularly, the off season was concerning because he couldn't watch his players um, and they wouldn't be under the eye of his player manager, Cap Anson, who was also of the same mind. Uh, he was a teetotaler himself. Um, so if they couldn't keep their players away from the bottle and in peak form over the winter months, uh, maybe there was a way to whip them into shape quickly before the start of the 1886 season. And so between them, a plan was hatched to send the team to the American spot, Hot Springs, uh, next March prior to the season start. And there, the plan was to boil out, in Spalding's words, boil out all the alcoholic microbes which may have impregnated the systems of these men during the winter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, over the course of two weeks, I guess the plan was to go down to Arkansas, use these miracle waters to jumpstart uh, 1886 campaign that will see them, you know, take vengeance on their rivals in St. Louis. But along the way, they're, they're going to start a new baseball tradition, and that's going to reach far beyond a single season. So I have here a, um, a brochure here from the late 19th century that was something you might see circulating around. Um, and it was advertising Hot Springs as this health and pleasure resort. And, and so, you know, at this time, trips to, to resorts like this were often prescribed by physicians to treat uh, a wide range of ailments. Uh, it was a holistic experience. It included not only taking uh, the water cure, cure in bathing and drinking the water, but, but exercise, walking up and down mountainsides, uh, all trying to improve the vascular system. Um, we're kind of, we're, you know, today we're familiar with that idea. It's no different. Uh, in regards to the, the actual healing powers of the waters, um, you know, there was a report in 1901 that states the curative effects were, were due mainly to stimulating the excretory organs, so the skin and kidneys. So, in other words, sweating and urinating, right? Um, so this, combined with hiking, would definitely help the players shed winter pounds. There's really no doubt about that. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's also maybe something to his intent to have them boil out harmful microbes uh, because that the mineral content in the waters can enter the body and form soluble salts with certain toxins, which again can be removed via the previous mentioned route of urination. So his squad left Chicago March 15th, uh, with some players even bringing their wives, and they arrived in Hot Springs a couple days later, and they found lodging at the Avenue Hotel, which is uh, on the corner of Park, Whittington, and, and Central. I've got it circled on this, this 1896 map. Uh, this is actually the future location of the Majestic Hotel, which is going to enter our, our story here in a bit. Um, so they stayed for a couple weeks. They received their course of baths um, according to plan. They also got in practice sessions between baths too. So there's there no formal baseball field with fences and stands yet in Hot Springs. Uh, but the team apparently utilized a makeshift field located near uh, where today's Garland County Courthouse stands on Washita Avenue. Um, so one can really imagine maybe the crowds that this might have drawn, right? Certainly not a national audience yet, but, but a local one, certainly. Uh, a local curious audience trying to figure out what this development might mean, what it means to have this team from Chicago in a nationally publicized trip here, um, you know, what, what's that going to mean for the town? Would other professional squads follow them? So that might largely depend how Chicago actually performs during the regular season. And if Spalding's scheme, in other words, would end in a repeat pennant and a championship over the St. Louis um, team. So what happened? Um, so the White Stockings did win the National League in 1886, but they actually lost again to St. Louis, four games to two. It was outright this time, no question. Um, Spalding, on his part, was still convinced that his team's underperformance against what he still saw as an inferior American association club was due to those alcoholic microbes. Um, so he made it known in the press that he would again have his squad make their way to Hot Springs for another preseason boil. 
And the difference this time, though, is they wouldn't be the only ones making the trip. Um, it seems that others, both professional, uh, National League, American Association, as well as minor league and amateur clubs, uh, took notice of what went down here in March 1886. So, again, Al Spalding was a very influential figure in the sport. It makes sense that others might follow his lead. Um, even Dave Fouts, who pitched for the rival St. Louis Browns, uh, made a visit to the spa that year in 87. He had a great season in 86, but he had a, split his two appearances on the mound against Chicago during their postseason series. So maybe he was also seeking a, a competitive edge to remain just in front of them uh, the following season. So, you know, the training routine for the, the White Stockings in March of 1887 would look largely the same, just expanded. So as reported in the Arkansas Gazette, uh, Cap Anson planned a five-week stay this time. Uh, in addition to the regular course of baths and practices, um, they would also play exhibition games every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Uh, that would uh, be mostly of the inter-squad variety. They would also need other baseballers, though, to fill in the gaps. Occasionally, a full Chicago squad would take on an imposing what they called a pick nine, right? Just pick them out of the crowd. Um, so, you know, Hot Springs in 1887, we can kind of see all the elements of, of baseball spring training as we know it. Um, so not only players getting into shape, but this idea of you've got these exhibition uh, matches, this full schedule as well with, with an audience. Uh, so, of course, you know, baseballers of all stripes poured into town in the lead up to the well-publicized White Stockings trip. Um, again, the Gazette reported visiting and local baseballists were practicing every afternoon to get into shape for the coming visit of our Chicago friends. Um, clearly, they saw this as an opportunity to, to prove their mettle against the pros and maybe even get signed to a major league squad. So. Even, even before Chicago arrived, uh, they were reporting crowds of up to 500 people just watching, uh, you know, the newcomers playing on the baseball diamond. And, and by this time, actually, the, the grounds had been improved uh, with the addition of a grandstand, uh, dressing room, and, uh, and a fence. So I'm showing here a map. This is from uh, uh, a couple decades later. Um, but this is the approximate location, this empty space of the baseball grounds. Um, and with the addition of that fence, this actually becomes the first enclosed baseball park in Arkansas. So Hot Springs had the first professional team come here for training, also has the first enclosed baseball park. So, um, and also early that March saw the formation of the Hot Springs Baseball Club. And you've got notable citizens sitting on its board so clearly, again, all the hype that we associate with spring training today, at least among baseball fans, they're, they're present in this early iteration. So when the White Stockings arrived, they found lodging in a different hotel, the Plateau Hotel, which stood on Central Avenue between Chapel Street and Washita. Um, so that you know, there were mishaps and errors throughout this trip. Uh, playing on the Hot Springs baseball grounds, even though it was a lot improved over the previous year, uh, it still had a pretty rough infield with rocks and pebbles, which you can imagine causes a lot of hiccups in fielding grounders. Uh, we can also safely assume that the Chicago team was probably not putting on their best performance, even though they were doing their best to get in shape. Um, the reason for this probably lies in their overzealous bathing regimen. Um, one of their players, Billy Sunday, described it. Uh, we were trying hard to get into condition to meet the Browns. We take hot baths every forenoon and practice on the diamond in the afternoon. So any of you who have you know, bathed in a hot bath like this knows you're going to feel pretty exhausted afterwards. And so imagine then going out into the hot afternoon sun to play a game of baseball. It's just not going to lead to desired outcomes. So, you know, this... Uh, this is what the Chicago team was doing in 1887. Um, there are numerous references to the Chicago side actually losing to a Hot Springs team throughout the month, but this is probably mixed benches of, of White Stockings players and, and visiting players just called Chicago and Hot Springs to differentiate them. 
Um, so at this point, we're going to leave the white stockings. They're going to continue to use hot springs as their spring training base until 1897. But a couple other famous teams would soon claim the American spot as their regular spring training grounds and, and actually use it for far longer. Um, still, we have to recognize the Chicago White Stockings as the organization responsible for bringing professional baseball here. And this is, of course, the encounter that would also establish modern spring training. And, of course, there were other southern sites like New Orleans that had actually hosted the White Stockings earlier in the 1870s. But it was hot springs that had the both the, the mild weather and the hot healing mineral waters, right? It was this combination plus other various attractions um, that would put hot springs on the map for baseball players and, and fans alike and, and keep it there for the next half century. And this secures our place in the mythos of America's pastime. So let's take a look at, at how that develops here and, and what this is billing us as the world's greatest athletic training grounds, bar none here in Hot Springs. Now, to, to understand how far reaching the allure of Hot Springs was, I, I think it, it's helpful to have a, a visual aid. So here we've got a list of teams, and, and this is prior to 1901, so these are all going to be National League teams. Later on, I'll differentiate American League teams with red rather than blue. Um, but basically, this just shows what teams sent their, their squads here by year, 1886 to, to 1900. And if we look at this, you know, quote unquote, pre-modern era, uh, you can see other early National League adherents here included teams from Pittsburgh, Cleveland, St. Louis, not the American Association, St. Louis, the, the, the St. Louis Cardinals weren't known as the Cardinals then. It's really confusing, but we'll just keep it as the Cardinals for simplicity. And, of course, Cincinnati Reds, another uh, initial National League team. Um, just, just a quick going back to team names. Um, so it was it's confusing in this time period. The Pittsburgh Club was actually known as the Alleghenies up until 1890, after which they adopted Pirates, which is, of course, the one they use today. Um, if you look at Cleveland – they are not the forerunner to the modern American League team that I root for in Cleveland um, because they're a member of the National League, and that one, the modern one, is an American League team. Um, so to add to the general name confusion, uh, like I said, you've got the St. Louis Cardinals, um, though when they visited they were known as um, actually the, the Browns, <laughs> which is not the same as the American Association Browns in the 1880s. Um, so again, very confusing, but the reason I brought all this up is not to frustrate you, but if you look right before the start of the 1899 season, um, this, the Cleveland spiders were here in hot springs for spring training. Uh, their franchise owner bought the Browns and decided to transfer all the good players from Cleveland to St. Louis. So and renamed them the Perfecto St. Louis, which is, which is a description that's the exact opposite of the resulting catastrophe of a season for the Spiders, who would go on to eke out uh, a 20 win to 134 loss record, which is, by the way, the highest single season loss total for a major league team, it was the lowest single season win total until last year, when the Pittsburgh Pirates only won 19 games. Of course, that, that was a season shortened by COVID. So all of this is to say um, that the National League squad from Cleveland ceased to exist after 1899. And if we go forward on this timeline, you will see that proven out. Um, so again, looking at the patterns on this rather than any individual team, uh, you can see that combined use of hot springs for spring training was pretty irregular. There are a couple years where there is a convergence of three clubs, uh, the first being 1894 when you have Chicago, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis scheduled to train here. Um, however, in the run-up to this, this um, well, not however, in the run-up to this, this mass of ballplayers in 1894, they, they built a new field to accommodate all of them. 
and that was at Whit in the Whittington Park area. And that would become uh, a new focal point for baseball in Hot Springs. So just a couple notes in, uh, regarding the Whittington Park complex. Uh, it sat just to the east of the Whittington Park portion of Hot Springs Reservation with its home plate facing northeast towards the hillside. Now in later photos, you're gonna see uh, a different orientation with home plate facing southeast, like I have here on the right. And that would put the grandstand up against the hillside. Uh, this is because Whittington Park was actually rebuilt in 1910 and they switched the orientation. And that grandstand in the new Whittington Park would actually burn down in March, 1930. So it, it no longer exists. Now, the, the Whittington ball field probably didn't get a whole lot of use in 1895. You can see that here. And that's because uh, that March saw a smallpox epidemic force the town into a citywide quarantine. Kind of sounds familiar. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, of threats here uh, to spring training in the early years in Hot Springs. It, it definitely was possible for it not to stick. A lot of mishaps occurred. Um, but we're going to see that it does. So jumping ahead to 1896, we see three teams converge again. Um, though the bulk of, of Anson's Chicago squad, which we're now going by the Colts, again, more nickname switching, they're actually encamped in Texas. They send a, they send a few players. Um, the, the Cleveland Spiders and the Pittsburgh Pirates would face off in a series of exhibition, exhibition games at, at, at Whittington. Uh, favoring it over the older, rougher grounds out by where the courthouse is today. Um, so, <laughs> you know, Cleveland would actually, I like to bring this up because I'm a Cleveland fan. Uh, they're going to beat Pittsburgh in that series. Uh, and, but, you know, Pittsburgh's going to get the last laugh just a few years later as the Spiders uh, are going to get caught up in that web of intrigue, right, and, and essentially get devoured. Um, so there's a reason that this post call card calls Whittington the Pittsburgh Baseball Park and not the Cleveland Baseball Park, as much as I would have liked that. Um, and not only that, but the Pirates were on their way to a, a real golden stretch of National League titles that just so happened to coincide with the longest stretch of training in Hot Springs by any major team. So you can draw your own conclusions from that coincidence. So the start of the modern era of Major League Baseball, so now we're looking post-1901, is going to lead to a stabilization of professional baseball at its higher, highest level, levels. The National League, is uh, American League, um, uh, combination is, is what we have today in, in modern Major League Baseball. And of course, that also happens to coincide with a period of consistency here in spring training. And if you look, each March from 1901 to 1916, the citizens of Hot Springs uh, could really rely on the Pirates returning to their grounds at Whittington Park. And the Buccaneers could be relied on to win. In those 16 seasons, Pittsburgh won their first four National League titles, which make up four of the nine pennants they hold to this day. It's also their best run in a single decade, and it saw them nab their first World Series victory in 1909. So, so not bad. Um, and a lot of their success can be attributed to the legendary Honus Wagner, who was an all-around talent and would be among the first class inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, so, you know, he was known uh, to really like Hot Springs, be a big proponent for it. And he's, he was known to say, I always liked it there. You know, walking up and down those Arkansas mountains was a good muscle builder in itself. Um, even after bad weather spoiled their spring training trip in 1915, he argued against future plans to abandon Hot Springs for, for Florida, citing the benefits of the mountains and the hot baths. And if we look, another major league team that's going to leave its mark on, on Hot Springs is the Boston Red Sox, who made a trip here each March, with few exceptions, for over a decade, from 1907 to 1923. Um, and in 1916, if you look in the Arkansas Gazette, they, they reported uh, the team's arrival, and they claimed of all the clubs that come here, there's none that has won a warmer place in the hearts of the resident than the Red Sox aggregation. So in addition to building up a fan base, 
Boston also built a new baseball diamond in spring 1909 to serve as their primary training ground. And they named it Majestic Field, which is named copied from their frequent lodging in town, the Majestic Hotel, which I mentioned earlier, right here it comes back into our story. The former uh, Avenue Hotel is sitting in its place. Um, so Majestic Field was located uh, pretty far south of that, south of Grand Avenue near Hot Springs Creek. And it was actually about a two mile trek for Boston from their lodging to the bathhouses, which fit in quite nicely with that training regimen um, that we mentioned earlier. So there, um, let's see. Looking back at our chart here, um, we're gonna see that in these years, uh, Boston from 1912 to 1918, they were going to be pretty reliable. Um, so they're going to win um, the World Series four times in 1912, 14, uh, sorry, 15, 16, and 18. And, you know, if I had to, you know, the ability to go back in time and see pro baseball here, I, I would probably choose this time. I mean, can you imagine watching and seeing the excitement building up in the lead up to two? Well, everyone, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties on Tyler's end, uh, so we'll, we'll take a, a brief hiatus. Uh, I'm going to contact him and appreciate your patience.
All right, thank you everyone for your patience. We have Ranger Young back here. The, the rain doesn't want this to happen on your internet service, but the show will go on. So I'll well, go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that cut out, right, as I was about to talk about um, Babe Ruth, of course, um, <laughs> and how he went from the Red Sox to the, the Yankees and all of that, and of course, the great curse. So um, that's probably what happened. We got cursed here. So in order to avoid that, let's let's avoid all mention of that guy again, and we'll just skip over that section <laughs> and go right into the, uh, the next part. So um, let me go ahead and share. There we go. All right. Okay. Fingers crossed. What's that? I said fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, right. I know the strategy of avoidance is going to work. <laughs> so if we look, going back to our timeline here, right? So we've had, we talked about the, the Pirates and the Red Sox being steady. Um, you also have a lot of other teams, right, on this timeline who come in and out. Um, but if you look, right, by the mid 20s, you can really see an era coming to a close here in, in the mid 20s. So both Pittsburgh and Boston are going to jump ship after particularly poor uh, spring weather wise in 1923. If you look at weather reports uh, for that, that year, it was actually one of the wettest springs on record, and it was really cold at times. So on March 14th of, of that year, we saw a temperature falling to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, you know, the teams were becoming unhappy with unreliable weather, um, which we saw this February. You know, we saw a big snowstorm. That's possible here. Not so much in, let's say, Florida or Arizona, okay? Um, and then for Boston, at least, the results on the field just weren't, weren't there anymore. In 1922 and 23, they ended in the cellar, um, you know, and I actually have this letter here from January 15th, 1924, so that the following winter, after two disappointing seasons, this is actually in the, the archives at uh, Garland County Historical Society, uh, you can, if you read it, so this is from the Red Sox to, um, to the, uh, the owner of one of the fields here. And he says, um, he mentions the past two seasons have been very bad in hot springs and a change would do us good. So maybe it's that, you know, uh, that uh, uh, suspicion or, or um, superstition rather in baseball. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of teams are going to start leaving uh, for warmer climates. And we see in the Arkansas Gazette uh, that same month, January 1924, they ran a story covering this exodus. So this was not going unnoticed here in Arkansas. Um, teams were going to Florida, Arizona, California. Um, but even though the majors started leaving, it doesn't mean pro baseball completely abandoned hot springs. In, in a lot of significant ways, it would stick around for another 30 years. Um, you know, throughout the 30s, even, there were still a lot of players, if not entire squads, uh, coming from those major teams. Um, they would make the trip here before joining up with the rest of their, their team. So Al Simmons is one of these, a uh, Philadelphia Athletics pitcher. He credited Hot Springs with, with saving his career in the late 1920s. When he was only in his early 20s, he started suffering from arthritis in his ankles. And after bathing and hiking here in Hot Springs, uh, he helped lead Philadelphia to a World Series victory in 1929. And so he would continue returning here, swearing by the spa throughout the 1930s. Um, for other players, you know, the initial springtime encounters with Hot Springs turned into more permanent affairs. Uh, we have here Cleveland hurler, so this is now the Cleveland Indians, uh, Willis Hudlin, shown with minor leaguer uh, and local Miles Hunter. Uh, he was visiting town, um, Hudlin was, for the first time on a spring training trip in 1927. Uh, by 1936, he was a regular at the country club and had plans to put down more permanent routes uh, in the area. Uh, soon he had set up camp on the shores of Lake Hamilton, and the Hudlin cabin actually became sort of an anchor point 
that kept Cleveland sending their pitchers to hot springs uh, for several more years uh, just to get their arms in shape. Well, not just to, probably with a healthy bit of, of line casting as, as well. You know, there were also um, other professional teams, if not the major national league and, and uh, uh, American league using uh, hot springs. And th those were the Negro leagues. So if you recall the father of spring training, right? Um, Al Spalding, he left his mark on pro baseball in another way. And that was by staunchly refusing to take the field against any integrated squad, which was a practice adopted by the National League at large. And, and this is going to lead to the formation of separate professional leagues uh, for black players in the turn of the century. Um, so we have the uh, you know formidable Negro League teams like the Kansas City Monarchs, uh, who trained here in Hot Springs in 1928. In 1952, one game of the Negro American League Championship Series was actually played here in Hot Springs. Um, so a World Series game, right? That was the Indi uh, Indianapolis Clowns uh, pictured here versus the Birmingham Black Barons. Um, and Hank Aaron actually, he played on the clown side. And if you know Hank Aaron, two years later, he would start his career with the Milwaukee Braves, later Atlanta Braves, um, and go on to be the, the um, home, you know, the career home run king. Uh, 1955. Um, also saw the final spring training visit by any um, any major league squad, and that's going to be the Detroit Stars of the Negro American League. And 1955 was really the end of professional baseball in Hot Springs. That year, the, the minor league, Cotton League, uh, Cotton States League folded, and with it went the Hot Springs Bathers, uh, who had called J.C. Park, which is in the same locale as the old Boston Grounds Majestic Field. Uh, this iteration of the Bathers um, got its start in 1938, uh, which was a horrible season for them. They, they finished last, but they would improve and win three Cotton State's League titles before their demise in 1955, which is not bad accolades to bring here to the birthplace of spring training. So... That brings us to the aftermath. By you know the mid 1950s, professional baseball had abandoned Hot Springs, um, and Hot Springs would have to mature on its own. And would something new fill the void left by baseball's departure? Well, as professional baseball dried up around here, uh, so did the bathing industry. Um, you know, here we've got uh, one of the many uh, abandoned interiors of a bathhouse along Bathhouse Road. Um, if you look back at some of the hotels, the Plateau Hotel, which the Chicago White Stockings stayed in, that burned in a 1905 fire. That is no longer around to be, be found. The Majestic Hotel was around until recently and burned in a fire, so that's no longer here. Of course, the original Hot Springs Baseball Grounds was lost to history as well. So we find these traces of baseball disappearing uh, from Hot Springs. Uh, Whittington Park, the longtime diamond where the uh, you know Pittsburgh and Boston would face off during spring training. That's now a parking lot. But you know, you see things coming back. You see baseball holding on. Uh, a new majestic field is uh, uh, being built, a new complex. Um, you know, if people can come here, to soak and bathe in the waters, they can still come and play baseball too. And it, and it turns out that that history is an attraction all of its own, right? So we also have here in town the historic baseball trail, and it keeps people in touch with these stories uh, better than I ever could. And it's supported by passionate people who also know way more about baseball than I ever will. So you have that here in town. And sometimes the, the remnants of, of the past are just a little more subtle. So what I mean right by that is, you know, if we look back at, at Honus Wagner, back in the days when he still ventured here, he also found time to help out around town. He helped out the local high school basketball team uh, by donating uniforms. And of course, they were in the Pittsburgh colors of black and gold. And that is the, the color of the, the high, uh, Hot Springs Trojans 
to this day. So, so in a lot of ways, baseball, I think, has never left Hot Springs. And in a lot of ways, it's coming back. It's on the rebound. And, and it's, it will continue to do so as long as we carry on those, those traditions. All right, thank you, Ranger Young. Um, and, and thank you everyone for watching uh, and bearing with us on the technical difficulties there, but I noticed we retained pretty good audience in spite of that, so appreciate you. Um, I do wanna give a, a final uh, call out if anyone has any questions or comments for Ranger Young, but are waiting for those. Uh, were there any uh, fun trivia facts that you left out during this presentation you'd like to share with us? Well, you know, the, the big one, um, I guess now I can I can risk saying his name again that the, the program, <laughs> the Vulcan is over. But, you know, Babe Ruth um, and the bellyache heard around the world when uh, he reported um, in 1925 to um, the Yankees training grounds in Florida after visiting hot springs. He, he arrives with a temperature of like 108, 105 degrees. Um, and just really sick. He would go on to collapse and miss the first half of that season. Um, and that is uh, a lot of people might credit that to sort of the, the death knell of, of um, spring training here as well. Uh, when, you, when you might be held responsible for, for Babe Ruth collapsing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I should also mention too, um, that you know, I, I said at the beginning of, of this program, there are just so many interesting stories that we just wouldn't have time to cover, right? This is supposed to be sort of broad stroke. So if there is interest you know, in a follow-up program on minor league baseball or, or you know, something like that, there's, just, it's, it's, there's a rich tableau of baseball here to cover. You heard it, folks. If you want a part two, just let us know. Um, had some great comments. Uh, Susan says, this is so cool. Thanks for watching, Susan. Carrie says, enjoying this great info on Hot Springs Baseball. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Keith, for watching. Um, had a question from Frank. Did any of the women's leagues or teams play here? I I just don't know. That is not, that's not something I um, I read into at all, and that's, that's my oversight. Um, there were certainly women involved in the stories, um, peripherally, at least that I read about, um, uh, groundskeeper at Whittington Park um, uh, was a woman for some time. Um, but yeah, that's a great question, and, and perhaps that is that is the part two that that should happen. Exactly. Um, so this is just a hypothetical scenario, but where would Major League Baseball be without? Hot Springs? Would all these teams have just found an alternative venue to play at, or was there something unique about us? Well, the, you know, the, the spring training would have come about, you know, um, that the, the competition that was emerging, that, that need to find that competitive edge um, over your rivals, that was going to push people to, you know, some team to adopt this standardized system that Spalding did. Um, but I think the reason that it happened in Hot Springs is because, because of the thermal waters here and, and their purported medicinal value uh, and the fact that it was becoming popularized at the same time that baseball was, right? So this is a story of two things growing up kind of separate at first, but at the same time. And so when baseball is coming into its own, so is the American spa. And so you get people like Spalding hearing about it and that, you know, putting on a light bulb. And so I don't think it's surprising that, that Hot Springs is the birthplace of spring training. Um, but I, I think had that connection not happened, it, it would have been an innovation that ha would have happened definitely before the turn of the century. Um, other than honoring this history, do you think there's a future for baseball here in Hot Springs beyond the legacy? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not much of a businessman, so I don't know what the economics are of a minor league team, um, you know, being here. Um, but you know, the, the future for baseball in Hot Springs, I think is also the future that, um, you know, we see in Hot Springs National Park. So we were once known as a health and pleasure resort more than we were, you know, a national park. Um, and of course that declined uh, in the mid century. 
and people no longer come here, you know, strictly to bathe and get well, but they still come here and visit Hot Springs National Park. And that's because we preserve that history, which is interesting. And likewise, I think the, the history of baseball is so interesting, especially in those early years when you get all those wild antics that you just don't see anymore. Um, you know, the front offices really clamp down and control every aspect of their players. So these wild stories can be enshrined here in Hot Springs. And you already see that happening uh, with the, the historic baseball trail. So I think Hot Springs role is that of a historian and, and, a, and a teller of tales. Seems like there's potential for a movie there too. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got the the documentary, The First Boys of Spring, but like a dramatic or comedic movie. I mean, again, I'm a Cleveland fan. Major League is one of my favorite uh, favorite uh, movies. I would definitely watch a movie about you know the Chicago White Stockings coming here and mishaps that happening. Uh, another story I didn't mention was that uh, uh, in their second trip here, a couple of their players came in on a train that had to go full speed through a burning bridge. The bridge was on fire. <laughs> and so, you know, just sort of the Wild West days, that would make a great setting. A question from Frank, is there a map that shows all the old baseball parks that were here? Uh, yes, well, so you've got the, um, the baseball trail, uh, the historic baseball trail um, there's an app you can download, um, and it won't show just fields, but, you know, it points those out. Um, if you just go on, on Google Maps, even, a lot of those markers will, will show up. But that's actually something that, um, you know, I considered making, um, making a little graphic sort of like I did with that chart. So it sounds like maybe I should uh, follow up on that um, and, and, and bring that to fruition. Just, just more for part two. Right. And I should say, too, um, um, if you if you look in those books, you know, Boiling Out uh, at the Springs uh, certainly has uh, some maps in there of the old parks. Are there any uh, baseball related programs that the National Park Service is involved in that people might be interested in or a tour or anything? Uh, no, this this was sort of it. I, I mean, in the past, yes, definitely. Um, there have been baseball programs. Um, you know, here behind me, I've got, I found just in our, in our, um, storage closet, this centennial baseball game, um, that has, you know, it would be fun to, you know, when we were able to do that, have like a, you know, play a game against a ranger day where we can play this board game about baseball and actually learn about the early sport in the process. A comment from Thomas. Thank you, Ranger Tyler. Very informative and thought provoking. Oh, well, thank you, Thomas. I'm glad. And, and this is, uh, on my end, likewise, we're getting all these ideas <laughs> for things to do. Exactly. Yeah, th thank you. It was very uh, thorough and, and you're very enthusiastic. So I appreciate that. And uh, I'll give you an opportunity. Are there any final remarks you would like to make? No, just uh, thank you for, for attending this. Uh, I was happy to do this program. Like I said, uh, you know, it really brought back a lot of good memories from my youth, and I hope that it, it did the same for those of you out there. So thanks again. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, this video was recorded, including our little technical difficulties there. But um, if, if you would like to rewatch this or share it with anyone or you missed anything, uh, it's available here on the library's Facebook page in our videos list and also on our YouTube channel. So. Um, Thank you again, Ranger Young and, and everyone for watching. And uh, if you have any suggestions, if you want to see Ranger Young back here for a part two, just let us know. And everyone, take care. Stay dry.